of interest is it was flanked with all of these different sequences through homologous recombination. And for the second part, you're working with a back mid. Right? And the back mid has you know, the lax C gene with the at sequence in the middle of it. So you're going to use uh, you know, site specific recombination there using the uh, the lambda you know, integration proteins to re recombine your gene of interest into the at sequence. All right, question 11, where do we find codons? Where do we find codons? Sorry. Two places. mRNA and where else? Which you had a code table. All right. So what codon are you going to change? You're going to change the codon for arginine. This one wasn't too tricky because it's just CBA. Right, but the codon you want is the codon for what was it, leucine, so it's CUA. That's the codon you want. Right, the DNA sequence in the non template strand would be a CTA, and the complement, which is what will be in the oligo you're making, will be a GAT. All right, so you know, keep straight. Which strand you're working with. Some of you, you know, I asked for the strand complementary to the non template, you gave me the non template anyway. All right, so make sure you uh, know which strand you're actually working with. All right, most of those were good. Uh, question 14. Um, two people got it right. Most of you were fairly close, like you didn't give me an example. Uh, fusion proteins are often created in a way that permits removal of the fusion tag used for purification of the fusion protein away from the protein of interest. So we have our tag, and then we have our protein of interest coding sequence. What do we have between them? The protease cleavage site goes here, right? So the PCS. And examples of that, enterokinase, factor 10A, uh, the tobacco etch virus and the human rhinovirus 3C proteus. Uh, those were the four that we talked about. I'm sure there are others now, but uh, those are the main four. Because if you cleave, you know, up right here, or at least close to that, you're getting rid of this stuff and you're left with what? The protein of interest. And again, that occurs after you've done the purification. And the last one. Uh, you know, how many times did I yell at you about the central dogma? How many steps in the central dogma? DNA to RNA to protein, right? So there are two processes that are occurring, two arrows, DNA to RNA, RNA to protein. If you read the question, all right, we're, number one, we're dealing with non-secreted proteins, all right? So it's not that E was secreted and we didn't isolate it. Same molecular weight, and they're cloned into the same plasma. So there's no difference in copy number, and it's the same promoter. So what am I telling you here about transcription? Transcription will be the same. Same strain, same plasmid, same promoter. The transcription isn't going to differ. Copy number isn't going to differ. All right, and they're not. The proteins aren't secreted. All right, uh, let's blah blah blah. In each culture, expression of clone gene was induced. Total protein extracts. So even if you had everything in inclusion bodies, it doesn't matter because you're extracting total protein, not just the soluble stuff, but total protein. That includes the inclusion bodies. All right, you throw it on the gel and you get a big blob for protein A, next to nothing for protein B. All right, so if transcription is the same because you've got the same promoter, what has to be different? Translation. All right, well, what affects translation if you're making some new construct? 
and we're dealing with prokaryotes here because it's E. coli. Number one should pop into your head what? Shine del Darno sequence. Number two, if you're making a new construct, you might block the a AUG with a um, you know, hairpin, stem loop of some kind. And three, when I showed the full version of this, what were we talking about? Rare codons. Okay. And I think I accepted uh, protein B might be degraded. Um, I think there might have, might have been something else to it. I don't have the answers written down here in the blanking. But, uh, you know, bad Shine Del Garno blocked AUG. Um, you, know, you, you could say blocked Shine Del Garno too if it's uh, involved in a hairpin. Uh, and then uh, lots of rare codons. Because uh, this was the, the lane for the 32 rare codon uh, protein. And that's why you don't see any overexpression. All right? So again, just because you transcribe a gene at high levels doesn't mean that you're going to get lots of protein if you can't translate the message. All right? And that was sort of the point of this, is that transcription is the same, but translation is not the same. All right. Uh, so again, look it over. I'll post the answers uh, probably tonight, and then uh, you can, if you have questions, email me or see me Wednesday. All right. All right. Let's, uh, uh, this is the handout that I forgot to throw about the last time. This goes back to the So this, uh, this side is uh, making the monoclonal antibody. Uh, I talked about this, but uh, this sort of uh, goes through it in, uh, in good detail. So again, you're uh, challenging a mouse because we um, are ultimately going to fuse the mouse B cells that are HG, uh, PRT plus, and are making an antibody, so they're IG plus with the HGPRT minus, IG minus myeloma cells. Again, myeloma cells are cancerous, they'll grow forever, you can culture them, etc. So we take the antibody producing B cells and myeloma cells, fuse them, and you know, have a whole bunch of different things in that cell fusion. Lots and lots of different uh, hybridomas, where it's a antibody producing B cell fused with myeloma cell, and then we've got myeloma cells, myeloma cells fused with myeloma cells, and B cells and B cells fused with B cells. When we put those in half medium, uh, only the hybridoma cells survive. So we end up with lots of different types of hybridoma cells because it's an individual B cell producing an individual type of uh, antibody fused to a myeloma cell. So all of those get cultured. Right? So each of these individual hybridomas are separately cultured in a little uh, you know, culture dish, uh, and then they're screened so you find the one that produces you know, the best, quote, best antibody. Right? Again, every, you know, every antibody protein being produced by those hybridoma cells are identical. All right, 
So in this case, we're taking number two here, let's say, uh, and here they're cloning it and expanding it to make lots of it. Uh, some of the cells get frozen, so that that's your frozen permanent. You can go into that you know, 15 years later and pull it out and you'll have the same monoclonal antibody. Uh, <clears throat> the other is uh, mass culture to produce lots of your monoclonal antibody. The stuff over on the right uh, is no longer done. This is a really old figure. Uh, probably hasn't been done for 15 or 20 years. Uh, the, uh, because the, the <clears throat> myeloma cells are a cancerous cell, you can actually inject them into the abdominal cavity of mice, and they would grow and essentially produce not really a tumor because they're individual cells, but they would proliferate inside the abdominal cavity of the mouse and continuously secrete monoclonal antibodies. And then you just stick a needle in and draw out the fluid from the abdominal cavity, and you have a big supply of monoclonal antibodies. But you're using mice in a pretty unethical way, so nobody does this anymore. Uh, it's all cell culture. All right, and then on the back, uh, well, hang on just a second. Uh, the step here where you've got all of these hybridomas and you select one of them, you know, how do you go through and decide which one of those you want? Well, that's on the back side where it's the monoclonal antibody screen. You start up at the top. <clears throat> You're going to have your antigen. Uh, that you want monoclonal antibodies to in your culture dish. And then you take, uh, so that's in each one of these little wells of your, your uh, culture dish. And then you transfer culture media from all of your different hybridoma cells uh, to the uh, individual wells. Right? And you test for monoclonal antibody binding. So in essence, you know, what we're doing here is basically uh, like an ELISA, only we're searching for the primary antibody, something that will bind to the antigen. The, you know, the monoclonal antibody may bind or it may not bind. In this case, it's binding. You wash it away, and then you add a secondary antibody, the rabbit anti-mouse, the monoclonal antibody of the mouse antibodies, with a reporter enzyme, wash that away, and then add the substrate. So if the primary antibody bound, your monoclonal, then the secondary antibody will bind to that. You've localized your enzyme. When you add the substrate, you'll have positive reactions. Those are the ones then that you will, you know, you know test for, see which ones have the best binding out of all of those. All right, and uh, they come at the bottom. And again, if the monoclonal antibody doesn't bind, then you, you're not gonna localize the secondary antibody or the reporter enzyme in that well. And those will be the, the clear wells. And the last, uh, this was on a slide, so going through the hat selection. Any questions on that before we go on? All right, so let's uh, go back. So we finished, we were talking about uh, detection methods that didn't rely on radioactivity, so non-rad detection systems. And if we're doing PCR, then we need some way to, to detect the amplified product. And one of the ways is using uh, fluorescent dyes, right? That we can attach fluorescent dyes to our oligonucleotides that are serving as primers, you know, probably just one. Uh, you know, Theoretically, you could do both. And then again, the primers are specific for the pathogen or whatever we're trying to detect. You amplify the DNA. And then the key thing is you have to separate the amplified fragment from the primers because you're going to have lots of primers that aren't incorporated. All right, and then you detect. All right, 
So our P1 and P2 are labeled here with a fluorescent dye. We do the amplification. Our amplified product will have our primers, but we also need to get rid of the unincorporated primers. That can be done uh, in a variety of ways, usually uh, little columns. You can separate it based on size. These are 18 to 25 nucleotides and single-stranded. These are you know, probably more than 200 base pairs and double-stranded. Or you can run it out on a gel as well. This will be at the electrophoretic front. These will migrate based on size. All right. So uh, we have a number of tests now that have uh, come out that are based on PCR. This one from a few years back. Uh, that was the first one uh, that was PCR based for detecting West Nile virus. So shortly after West Nile became a problem. Uh, the Roche uh, Pharmaceutical Company came up with this Cobus Tech Screen West Nile Virus Test. Second of its kind approved in the US. Uh, there's a PCR test for strep throat. All right. Uh, here, the Lyra Direct Strep Assay uh, from Quidel. Uh, multiplex real time. Multiplex means you're detecting more than one uh, DNA fragment. Real-time PCR chain uh, can identify and distinguish throat infections linked to pyrogenic group A streptococcus, those associated with group C and group G. Right. Uh, apparently, it doesn't detect group B. Either. Right. So again, these are becoming more prevalent as we get better at uh, designing things. Now. Um, <coughs> Uh, another way of, of doing non-rad detection systems uh, is, again, DNA-based, but it doesn't rely on PCR. And this involves what's called a molecular beacon. And here, uh, it's not based on amplification, it's based on hybridization, where you have a single-stranded DNA probe that's 25 nucleotides in length, all right, where you have 15 nucleotides in the middle that's complementary to your target. And then the five nucleotides at each end are complementary to each other. So we're designing a hairpin here where uh, <clears throat> we've got a 15 nucleotide loop and then five base pairs um, sort of as the stem. We've got a fluorescent dye, a fluorescent dye attached to one end and a molecule that's called a quencher attached to the other. And if they're in close proximity, Whatever fluorescence is generated when you excite the fluorescent dye is absorbed by the quencher. So you don't see any light being emitted. Right? So <clears throat> the idea is uh, if you have your target DNA, again, single-stranded, your molecular beacon, uh, if the molecular beacon doesn't hybridize, then the fluorophore and the quencher remain close together. And you won't see any excitation or emission of light. But if it, the molecular beacon hybridizes, then your fluorophore is you know, 15 or more nucleotides away from the quencher. And then it will emit light, and that's what you detect. So here, <clears throat> you don't have the problem with the PCR where you have to separate your amplified product from the primers. Here, your uh, probe isn't going to fluoresce unless it's hybridized to something. And again, 15 nucleotides is usually enough to be specific for a particular um, product. Uh, and you can also multiplex this by adding uh, different sorts of uh, fluorescent dyes here, fluorescent different wavelengths, and then a, a quencher as well. So a specific fluorescent uh, molecule with its quencher uh, you know, so four, in this case, four different molecular beacons could be used in a particular reaction to try and detect four different things. Right. Right. Now, uh, you can use these in uh, detecting different genotypes as well, uh, where, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you have two different molecular beacons, one that will detect uh, the wild type, and one that will detect uh, the mutant sequence, where there are at least you know, one base different, maybe more. 
So homozygous wild type, you'll have two of these uh, light blues uh, hybridized uh, <coughs> you know, to the allele, and if it's homozygous mutant, you'll have uh, two of these sort of pink ones. What if you have a heterozygote? Yeah, they'll both hibernate. So you detect both this fluorescence as well as this fluorescence. All right, uh, we're gonna shift gears here a little bit and do a little bit of uh, DNA fingerprinting or DNA typing. Uh, and this is usually some sort of legal proceeding where you're trying to identify um, someone either in terms of uh, forensics, uh, you know, identifying remains, identifying who committed the crime, etc., or in paternity cases, you know, who's the daddy sort of thing. Uh, and again, it's uh, evidence to either support conviction or exonerate someone uh, or to support or rule out parentage. Now, most of the current types of DNA fingerprinting are based on short tandem repeats. These are uh, sequences that are four bases in length, but uh, you'll have multiple repeats of those four bases, anywhere from three repeats up to maybe 14 repeats. And you do PCR of each of these different STRs uh, with a specific set of primers. They base pair outside of the repeat and then you amplify the repeat and a bit of additional sequence. The FBI and the state labs use uh, 12 different sets of primers, so 12 different loci, and then one for sex. Uh, and if you use all 13, your probability of specific identification is greater than one in five million. And how many people on the planet? 7.5. 7 billion, but this is low. It's actually higher than that. Uh, they use fluorescent primers um, and, again, 13 different markers for these uh, short tandem repeats. So here's a case where we have a, uh, in this case, at this particular locus, we've got two alleles, it's heterozygous. The one on the top has, what, uh, three, six, seven. The one below has five. All right, and the primers anneal outside. You know, if these are four base, four times seven is what? 28, okay, and four times five is 20. So the actual uh, repeat itself is, you know, 28 and 20. But because the primers sit outside and conserve sequences, they're actually amplifying 132 and 124. <coughs> Note, they're eight bases different in size. That's the two repeats that stood seven and five. All right, so when you amplify this, you should see two bands. Uh, one indicating seven repeats and one indicating five repeats. All right, there was something there that isn't there anymore. What was there a figure there? In, there was a figure. Pardon? There, there was. They're saying it's not can't be displayed. Can't be displayed. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's just go on. Um, this is a. Uh, image that I got from a former student who was uh, working in the state crime lab that uh, was uh, on Braddock Road. And this sort of illustrates uh, you know, what they do when they are running uh, these multiple, uh, <coughs> multiple tests to detect different alleles. I think they're running, if I remember correctly, they're running at least three or four different alleles on here. They're trying to maximize how much data they can get from each gel they run. Uh, and because these are legal proceedings, lawyers require that every sample is run next to a standard. So if you look at this, uh, you've got a ladder of green, two lanes, another ladder of green. So each sample is run next to a ladder. So that uh, you, know, you can't argue about the size of a particular fragment because it's right next to an allelic ladder. And the allelic ladder uh, are amplified fragments that are from the, the smallest known allele to the largest known allele. All right. And you know, the, so this is 
one, this is one, and then I think this is one if you're looking at the green. The red uh, run all the way across the lanes, that's to sort of eliminate uh, smiles and frowns that you occasionally get when you run your gels, right? To allow you to, to see if the ladders don't quite match up. Well, yeah, it's because there's a little bit of a dip here uh, in how the gel runs. So if we're looking, let's, uh, where's a good example here? Well, if we take a look at this one, let's say the, the, uh, the, the second of the sample lanes here is uh, evidence from a crime scene. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if we're looking across this and looking at all the other sorts of lanes, if these are suspects, the collected <coughs> samples from lots of different suspects, then they haven't ruled out many people because most of the individuals, here's one that's different, this one's the same, this one's different, and this one's different. So, you know, one STR isn't going to cut it, right? You can't rule everybody out. That's why they run 12 different ones and one for sex, because, um, you know, too many cases, the alleles aren't uh, distinguishing between individuals. But if you get enough alleles, then they are. All right, um, again, 13 individuals can identify people Near certainty, again, anything that leaves uh, DNA behind, hair, blood, saliva, semen, etc., any sort of biological, there'll be DNA there. Uh, and if you run all 12, uh, you know, these are the odds I got from somewhere. Uh, one in three times 10 to the 11th for Caucasian, Caucasian Americans. So, again, how many people on the planet? Seven billion. Something like that? 7.5 billion. 7.5 billion, that's billion is what? 10 to the 9. So theoretically, you can identify people with certainty. Theoretically. All right, and again, in some cases, uh, you may not run all 12. You may run, uh, you know, sets of these, uh, you know, and sort of increasing as you try to specifically identify someone. Uh, but if you just run these three, for Caucasian Americans, it's one in 435. So that's, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> you need, uh, you know, even one in 16,000. You need all of these, you know, here, uh, both of the above tri triplexes, so six loci, one in 400,000. Yeah, that's probably not going to hold up for you. All right, so again, primary uses here, forensics, criminal cases, paternity suits, uh, and then uh, identification of remains, both battlefields, and then uh, they use this as well for the World Trade Center and, and uh, the Pentagon for terrorist uh, attacks. All right, I'm going to skip this in a rapid because I don't think anybody really does this anymore because sequencing has sort of replaced it, so we can eliminate that. Real-time PCR, you guys learned that in genetics, right? Okay, I'm going to skip that as well. Um, oh, and um, other uh, tests, here's uh, another one, uh, this COVAS uh, HPV test, it's a real-time PCR assay, this is for human papillomavirus, which can cause uh, different types of uh, cancer in people, um, so if you haven't gotten your vaccine, you may be getting a test instead. All right, um, I ran across this a few years back, and it was hilarious. Uh, yeah, this is back in 2010. California University to implement genetic testing program. All right, what would you think if Mason instituted a genetic testing program? Uh, Cal Berkeley will be implementing a voluntary genetic testing program for this year's incoming freshmen. The program aims to study samples for three genes that aid the metabolism of alcohol, lactose, and folates. All right, one bioethicist has expressed concern about the move to conduct genetic tests outside of a medical setting, saying such tests need to be accompanied by counseling support. Now, you know, you're not, you're testing for metabolism of alcohol, lactose, and folates. Uh, you know, it's not, you're not looking for genetic disorders that might be recessive or might be uh, you know, dominant, but uh, you know, to 
displayed late in life or something. Uh, you know, so if you have a uh, mutation that doesn't allow you to metabolize alcohol, what do you do? You avoid alcohol. All right. I mean, it's sort of logic, but if you know people. They don't understand what's going on, and they'll get all bent out of shape. So there probably should be genetic counseling. But again, they don't do this anymore. The study is encouraging students to drink. It's not testing people and saying, "Here, have a bottle of vodka, let me treat you." So I don't see. The well, but there. if uh, if they test your genes and you don't have mutations in alcohol metabolism, aren't they implying that you can drink as much as you want? Um, that's how some students would interpret this. I know I would. <laughs> would have to be All right, so and again, this is genetic bioethicists are always going to say this. All right, because people don't understand what the tests mean. All right, let's. We're going to sort of continue on the same vein here, but we're going to now look at uh, trying to identify genetic diseases. So the more we know about human genes and genetic diseases, the better we'll be able to, number one, diagnose the diseases maybe early, and that, uh, you know, we can identify then carriers, we can you know, counsel individuals who are carriers as to whether or not they want to have children. Uh, we can do prenatal diagnosis in some cases if there are carriers and, and you know, there's a likelihood of having a child with a particular disorder. And in other cases, you can do early diagnosis and maybe sort of uh, get treatment started early to lessen the impact of the genetic disorder, at least in cases where you can actually do that. Uh, here's sort of a one example of how this can be applied, and this is uh, diagnosis of sickle cell anemia. Uh, and with sickle cell anemia, this particular kind, there's a single nucleotide change, causes a, a single amino acid change, uh, valine, which is nonpolar, into glutamic acid, which is negatively charged. So it's a big shift in the characteristic. And uh, you know, by altering hemoglobin, you alter the erythrocytes. And uh, they're very irregularly shaped. And they can't carry sufficient oxygen, so there's uh, anemia, uh, and there's often, uh, often they you know, clog capillaries as well. You end up, individuals who have this end up with progressive damage to the major organs, and uh, you know, typically have a shortened life expectancy. Right? Now, individuals who are homozygous uh, for sickle cell, we can say you know, they're cap S, cap S, uh, and heterozygous will be cap A uh, a little less. Uh, again, no symptoms. If you're heterozygous, it's a, you know, a recessive trait. Carriers of the disease, though, so if two carriers marry, uh, you know, fill in your Punnett square, you'll have a 25% chance of having an effective child. 50% chance of having children who are carriers, and a 25% chance of having a homozygous unaffected child. All right, now in uh, this particular case, the nucleotide change that affects the, the hemoglobin protein uh, actually ends up disrupting a restriction enzyme site. All right, so the CBN1 site is CCTN, AGG, and in normal DNA, the N is a G. All right, so that's fine, but in the mutant DNA, it's the A is converted into a T. Right, and that disrupts the restriction enzyme site. So if we you know, digest DNA with uh, CBN1, we're going to see a different pattern between normal DNA and mutant DNA. All right, and that's what's shown here. So if we amplify a region around the mutation, uh, in this particular case, we're amplifying about 726 base pairs that in the uh, normal sequence contains three CBN1 sites, we're going to cut it into four fragments. All right, 256, 201, 181, and 88 base pairs. 
Now, the CVM1 site that's affected by the mutation is the middle one. So if we amplify uh, the mutant sequence and then digest it with CVM1, we're not going to cut this uh, middle piece. So we're going to have, we'll still have the 88, we'll still have the 256, but the, the 201 and the 181 base pair fragments will remain together. So we'll have a 382 base pair fragment. So in uh, homozygous normal, we'll see this pattern. In homozygous uh, sickle, we'll see this pattern. What will we see if we have the heterozygote? Yeah, we'll see both. So you'll see a 382, we'll see a 256, twice as much, the 201, the 181, and then twice as much of the 88. Okay, that's what's shown here. So um, almost like it's normal, we see the 256, 201, 181, and 88. Uh, this, the, the sickle homozygous, here's our 382. Note that these two disappear, and they're up here. And then for the uh, heterozygote, we see all of the different size fragments. In fact, you know, the 88 should be doubled, and the 256 should be doubled, because you're going to have twice as much of those compared with the other three. All right, any questions on that? All right, now, you know, if you think about uh, you know, what's the probability of a mutation changing a restriction enzyme site, uh, it's probably pretty low. So uh, while it works in this particular case, it's not gonna work for every genetic disorder. So we need other methods, uh, <coughs> other strategies for trying to detect mutations in genomes, mutations that affect specific genes. All right, there are four different ways of doing this. Uh, PCR, OLA, padlock probes, uh, PCR genome typing, and DNA chips. All right, some of these are pretty similar, um, or at least somewhat similar. Others are, are quite different. All right. uh, the PCR OLA, the OLA stands for oligonucleotide ligation assay. So we're gonna, basically we're gonna amplify the DNA first, and then we're going to uh, anneal oligos and ligate them together. And if the sequence is different, we won't be able to ligate the oligos. All right, so amplify the target, and we have two sets of oligos. We have a set for normal, and we have a set for the mutant DNA. All right, because we have two sequences. Uh, in each case, we, within our two sets, we have probe X that's labeled with biotin, probe Y that's labeled with digoxygenic. So we've got our tags at each end that are going to allow us to detect whether or not we've linked the two uh, oligos together. And the key thing is the last base of one oligo is complementary to wild type, but not mutant. All right, and then in the other set, the last base of one oligo is complementary to the mutant, but not the wild type sequence. All right, so one oligo and I think uh, you can say probe Y, it's going to be the same in both, all right? Because we're looking at single base differences here. So let's take a look at this, all right? So here we're looking at our wild type set of uh, oligos, all right? So in normal DNA, our probe X base pair is completely. We've got an AT base pair at the end, and our probe Y base pair is completely as well. But in the mutant DNA, we have a different sequence at the end of probe X. So this AG don't base pair. All right, and so when we anneal both oligos to our amplified uh, template DNA, here we have complete base pairing. Our two bases are sitting right there together. Over here, they're not sitting together. So when we add our uh, ligase, we can link them together with normal DNA and detect normal DNA, but over here we're not going to link the oligos together. Right. Now the biotin and the digoxygenin are what allow us to detect whether or not the ligation has occurred. And again, if ligation occurs, then you're detecting normal DNA if you're using the normal set. If you're using the mutant set of primers, you're going to detect the mutant DNA. Right? So again, we have these two situations. We've ligated them together, or we haven't ligated them. Now, 
This is, uh, we take our mix then and put it into our microtiter plate wells where we have streptavidin. Remember, streptavidin binds biotin tightly. So we're always going to bind the probex with the biotin. All right, and if we've ligated the oligos together, we still have the digoxygenin. All right, but in the case here where we had mutant DNA with the wild type probes, we didn't ligate them, so the probe X binds, but the probe Y gets washed away. So we don't have digoxygenin here. So the protection now relies on an antibody to digoxygenin. Right? And the antibody has a reporter enzyme, in this case alpha-phosphatase. So we add the antibody, get it to bind, then add the substrate, and uh, convert the substrate into some sort of colored product. Right? But if we haven't ligated the oligos together, when we add the antibody, it doesn't bind to anything, it gets washed away. When we add the substrate, nothing happens. Right? So analogous to the ELISA, at least you know, a little bit in terms of the antibodies with reporter enzymes and, and substrate. But the key thing is, do you ligate the primer set together? All right, oligonucleotide ligation acid, the PCR polar. All right, so summary of technique, ligation of oligos gives you positive detection, no ligation, negative detection. And again, you're going to run uh, <clears throat> your test with both pairs of oligos. So it's a wild type pair and a mutant pair. Uh, what happens if you have a heterozygote? What's going to happen? What will happen with the wild type pair? A positive result or a negative result? Positive. positive. If you have the mutant pair, what are you going to see? It's a heterozygote. Isn't the mutant sequence there? Yes. And so you'll get a positive result as well. All right? If it's homozygous wild type DNA, you'll see a positive result with the wild type and negative with the mutant. If it's homozygous mutant, you'll see a negative result with the wild type and a positive with the mutant. But if it's heterozygous, you have both the wild type sequence and the mutant sequence. And so the wild type will give you a positive result because you have wild type sequence there. The mutant pair primers will give you a positive as well because you've got the uh, mutant sequence there, right? So in heterozygotes, you get a positive with both sets of primers, all right? Now, you need to run the appropriate controls here because if you keep getting positives all the time, uh, either you have a lot of heterozygotes or um, you've got something wrong with your test. All right, any questions on PCR OLA? Again, you amplify first, so you just, that's just to give you lots of template, and then use uh, anneal your oligos to start ligating them. Questions? No. Uh, padlock probes, uh, pretty much the same thing. Again, oligonucleotide base, complementary to the target at the ends, uh, but not in the middle, and so the end space pair, and if it's a perfect match, they can be ligated. So again, similar to the oligo, uh, the PCR OLA, uh, in that you know, right here where they join is where you're going to see a difference in uh, you know, the sequence. Right. So uh, in this case, uh, you've got reporters on the part that doesn't base pair. So if you have 100% uh, complementarity, you'll ligate this and it'll stick. Uh, if it's mismatched, it won't ligate, and you don't have enough uh, sequence that's base pairing to allow it to, to, to stick. So again, uh, <clears throat> with your DNA bound in the microtiter well, uh, if they're ligated, then it stays, and you can detect your reporter molecules, but if it's not ligated, it gets washed away, because you only have you know, maybe uh, 10 bases on each side, and you can run this at a temperature where it won't hybridize. It won't base pair. All right, and then nothing's detected. All right, and again, you're going to have two different padlock probes, one for wild type sequence and one for uh, the uh, mutant sequence. 
So it's basically pretty similar to the um, PCR OLAP in that regards. All right, PCR genotyping, uh, again, similar to the PCR OLAP in that you have two primers, P1 for wild type, P2 for uh, uh, that's common, and P3 then is for the mutant gene. So P1 and P3 distinguish, uh, P2 is in you know, common sequence. You label your primers differentially. So your two different primers have different uh, fluorophores, you know, fluorescent red or green or whatever your favorite colors are. Uh, and again, it's the last base of these distinguishing primers that is uh, you know, complementary with either the wild type sequence or the mutant sequence. And that difference in base pairing uh, will permit amplification or prevent amplification on which DNA you have in there. So with wild type DNA, uh, P1 and P2 will allow amplification, but uh, you know, with mutant DNA, the P1 mismatch will prevent amplification. Right, and again, you're gonna have to uh, adjust your temperatures so that uh, you don't extend even though you have that mismatch. So that's uh, something that uh, you know, needs to be worked out pretty pretty closely, all right? And then with uh, mutant DNA, uh, P3 will base pair, and so you amplify the mutant DNA with P3, you protect this amplified product, uh, but with wild type DNA, P3 doesn't base pair, and so you won't amplify. And again, with the heterozygote, what are you gonna see? Right. Heterozygote, you'll have mutant DNA, P3 will amplify. We go back, you'll also have wild type DNA, so your P1 will also amplify. All right, and that's you know, if you detect both red and green fluorescence. All right. Um, with Pac Man, um, you have single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is sort of what we've been talk talking about, which you know, are what you typically find in, in many genetic disorders. Uh, and here you've got uh, you know, a wild type probe with one fluorescent uh, molecule, mutant probe with the second one. Uh, again, fluor at one end, quencher on the other. So similar to uh, the molecular beacon, but here we're actually going to do some amplification. Uh, so no fluorescence in bound or unbound state. All right. So during PCR, the TAC DNA polymerase displaces and cleaves the TACMIN probe that's bound to DNA. Separates the fluor from the quencher, and that's when you detect uh, the fluorescence. So only when you, you know, chop up the TACMIN probe do you detect the fluorescence. So, uh, you know, when you're amplifying it, the, the probe is bound to one strand. As the polymerase is coming along, uh, you're going to, and these uh, enzymes have the 5 to 3 XO preceding the polymerase, right, running out ahead, and it will degrade any DNA that's bound to that particular strand. And so it you know, degrades the TACMAN probe. And once it does that, you know, the, the fluor is separated from the quencher and, and it fluoresces. And again, you're going to have a wild type fluor and a mutant fluor. All right, and the last one here is the DNA chip. Uh, and we sort of alluded to this back when we were doing uh, DNA sequencing. But uh, you can synthesize oligos directly on you know, supports now. You know, here it's referred to as a glass chip. And analogous to how they print uh, circuits, computer uh, circuits, you can essentially do photolithography on you know, blocking certain areas and allowing other areas to react. Uh, these chips are one square centimeter in size and you can cram probably more than 100,000 different sequences on you know, that little area. All right, so you label your sample DNA with a fluorescent dye, uh, and you denature the sample DNA, and then you hybridize it to the oligonucleotides on the chip. 
And like with the sequencing, uh, the chip is scanned with a fluorescence microscope and it detects where the fluorescence is. And the computer, you know, based on putting your controls on, knows what the sequence of that olive is. All right, so if there's fluorescence there, and you know the sequence of that oligo, then you know, what's hybridized to it is the complement. Right? And computer analysis of the fluorescence pattern then tells you what the sequence is. Right? Uh, one of the companies uh, that was the leader in this is Appymetrics. Uh, just a disclaimer, I used to own stock in Appymetrics, sold it quite a while ago, made a lot of money, yay. <laughs> uh, that's always good. Uh, and They've designed chips for HIV diagnosis and uh, P53 mutations, which again, P53 is mutant in half of human cancers, so it's a yeah, pretty important gene. Uh, and again, these are fairly small chips. This is the roughly one centimeter square area where you're going to hybridize and have all the fluorescence. All right, now with our ability to uh, <coughs> sequence the, the genome and, and identify different uh, gene mutations, we can develop gene tests to do lots of different things. So here, you know, this interleukin genetics is trying to develop gene tests that predict obese people's response to different diet plans. So they look at five SNPs for genes, uh, you know, the fatty acid binding protein, two peroxisome proliferating activated receptor gamma, and then these beta adrenergic, adrenergic receptors, uh, thinking that you can correlate mutations in these with weight loss. Right? Again, counseling needed for these people, I'm sure. Uh, Another test that's being developed for advanced prostate cancer, uh, <clears throat> where you know, lots of old guys get uh, prostate cancer, usually it's not a problem because it's not uh, like growing fast, they're gonna die of something else before the cancer actually kills them. But some types of prostate cancer are much faster growing, and uh, you know if you can do gene tests to find out if that's the type of cancer you're dealing with, then again, you can do different sorts of therapy. You go in and can operate or use radiation, whatever you need to do to try and, and uh, you know, take care of the cancer, provide the appropriate therapy. And that's basically what this is. They're trying to identify specific genes uh, that correlate with advanced prostates. So if you can identify those in a particular prostate cancer, then you can provide the appropriate uh, therapy. All right, uh, unfortunately, this particular slide is all too uh, common when we're dealing with gene tests. Uh, gene tests are ineffective in detecting cardiac risk in women. Uh, the study 19,000 women uh, found that genetic tests that used more than 100 genetic variations were not effective in pinpointing women who are at risk of developing heart disease. All right, so either they picked the wrong mutations uh, the wrong diseases, or you know, the wrong genes, or something, um, or the wrong women. I don't know, uh, but uh, at least in this particular study, uh, you know, they couldn't uh, predict uh, heart disease based on what uh, the genotype was of the individual women. All right, and uh, this also is fairly common. Breast cancer test ad, this is from a few years back, and this has uh, had lots of press since this slide. Uh, breast cancer test ad raises concerns. This is Myriad Genetics with their uh, test for BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, the, and I don't remember the specific ad, so I can't tell you, you know, what the exact problem was, but uh, Cancer and genetic specialists say the ad could create unnecessary fear among women and lead to overuse of the test. You know, from the company's standpoint, overuse of the test would be good, all right? Especially if they're charging $3,000 per test. Uh, the company received a subpoena for information from the Connecticut Attorney General. Uh, you know, and, and again, this is where, uh, especially when you're dealing with uh, both cancer genes, um, where you do need genetic counseling because you know, positive tests 
don't mean that you're going to come down with cancer. All right, it means you may have a higher likelihood of getting the cancer. And negative tests don't mean that you're not going to get breast cancer because it can develop after the test or uh, you know, they may not test the specific mutation you have or it's a different mutation that results in the breast cancer. So uh, again, you know, we sort of joke about the, you know, everybody needing genetic counseling, uh, but in some cases it's pretty important for the lay people because they don't understand what the tests actually mean. All right, <clears throat> questions on genetic tests? All right. Um, ten minutes. I'm not going to start the next chapter. Not, not for 10 minutes. All right. So while I got early today, I've posted uh, 10 and 11. I'll try and get 12 posted.